And today I'm going to talk about WASM for AI infrastructure. Uh, to use WASM uh, to run a lightweight, fast, and secure uh, AI inference. So the uh, GitHub repo is our project. It's a CNCF sandbox pro project called the WASM Edge. So I'm going to talk about the following several topics. And first, I'll talk a little bit about myself and the project. So I just uh, actually flew from Tokyo. Uh, it, it, they have an open source summit uh, last week. And uh, yeah, I also gave a talk there. And it's one of the highlighted talks. So I got a lot of audience. It was a uh, really quite intense. And um, we also had a lot of developers who have been using the, uh, our runtime. And uh, so I mostly uh, organize dev meetups and conferences. And um, I'm one of the CNCF ambassadors. And I uh, sometimes write technical blogs and documentations and do Chinese English translation. Uh, so uh, you can see the Japan one is the talk I did, I just mentioned. So that happened last week at the Japan Open Source Summit. And uh, we also did some meetups about Rust language and WebAssembly in Singapore. Uh, the Singapore one happened in early September, uh, late September, I think. And also uh, another one in Shopee last December. Uh, in Singapore. So uh, this uh, WASM at runtime is, uh, uh, we are using WASM on server side. So it's a highly efficient and lightweight um, sandbox. It's like a container. So you can think of it as um, Docker, but it's much more uh, lighter. It can also run side by side with uh, uh, it, it can run inside Docker. So it, uh, in some use cases, uh, it can replace Linux containers because it's much more lightweight and it has uh, zero startup time. So yeah. Uh, these are some of the partners that we've been uh, working with in the ecosystem. And the, the screenshot is uh, that uh, is saying that uh, Oracle is also also using us, but uh, we didn't know before because we are open source uh, software and they have been using it without telling us. So yeah, uh, so we just found out uh, in Chicago's uh, KubeCon uh, several months ago. Uh, so yeah, we are going to uh, what we want to talk about today. Uh, so right now, when we uh, want to run AI, we, use, we are used to do it with Python and Docker. And Python has been really popular because it's very easy to learn and use. It has a really big uh, community. I, I just saw some uh, attendees today are we wearing PyCon t-shirts. So uh, Python is, is being really popular. And uh, also Docker. Docker has been established for almost 10 years and it has a very mature tooling and uh, is very portable portable and scalable. So uh, that's why um, right now everyone has been choosing uh, Python and Docker. Um, but Python does has uh, its limitations. So um, on the right screenshot is a paper published on science. So it's saying that uh, after Moore's law is uh, um, going to an end, uh, what will drive com a computer's performance? Because uh, before, for the past uh, four decades, um, people have been optimizing the semiconductors, the hardwares, and not caring too much about the performances of software. But uh, you can see as a benchmark here that Python has been um, really uh, taking a lot of times much slower than the other languages. So the per performance is, has been uh, a real bottleneck. And um, 
Uh, also, parallelism, um, GIL ensures that only one thread executes Python bytecode at a time, which is also a, a problem. And also, memory management can be very difficult. You have to have a lot of Python dependencies, which take a lot of space. So, how about Python plus C and C++? Uh, so, the portability issue um, can be also big. So uh, there is also maintenance cost, and uh, Python would interact with native libraries or system level um, dependencies across different environments uh, differently. So you have to uh, do a lot of configuration when you change to another environment. And also, the integration can also be um, very complicated. Like uh, when you glue Python to other languages like C or C++, there are a lot of uh, management of uh, data work, management work of data types, memory allocations, and a lot of error handling. Uh, for example, like PyBind 11, this gluing process is really um, going to make a lot of uh, uh, trouble sometimes. And so um, the developers would need to have a very deep understanding of Python and the other language to. Um, uh, so, so this has increased the development time and risk. Uh, so this uh, guy, uh, Chris Auburn, he's uh, the CTO of uh, Wikipedia. He said um, he has uh, been having a hard time to install Python. And Greg Brockman, uh, he's, uh, he was uh, he quitted OpenAI, but then was rehired. So Greg was the uh, engineering chief for um, for OpenAI. He also said um, machine learning engineering uh, has to tackle this problem, that is to make Python not your bottleneck. And also, um, th this guy on the right said, um, well, I've been um, taking a lot of time to just install Python. And it's, it shouldn't be like that. And also for, um, you, uh, I'm not sure if you have heard of Mojo, it's a new language created by Chris Latner. He's a, a creator of LLVM and uh, Swift, a Swift programming language. And he said um, he want to, uh, use Mojo to replace Python because Python has been such a headache. Uh, so, uh, also there are limitations with Linux containers or Docker. So it has a long code start time and uh, the disk space is big, like several gigabytes and the hardware accelerator support uh, is lacking and also uh, for the portability part, it has to be different for uh, different CPU architecture. And uh, the security also can be a problem because it relies on the user permission of a uh, uh, host operation system. Uh, so it might um, introduce some risks. Uh, so now uh, that's what we want to talk about today. Uh, we would uh, think Rust plus WebAssembly is the uh, right uh, solution that we should go for. So um, uh, on the right uh, is um, Elon Musk saying that Rust would be the language of a AGI age. So uh, he, you might be hate, hating him, but uh, I guess that's how Elon thinks uh, Rust would be really important. So um, um, performance and memory safety. Uh, so Rust, if you have a bug, you, you cannot even compile it through. So it's uh, very secure. And um, uh, you can see the others. So um, they have uh, Cargo, this um, modern package management tool. And it also has a rapidly going, growing ecosystem. Uh, we are hosting a lot of uh, Rust events uh, in China and uh, uh, also in other places, like uh, even in Silicon Valley as well. And we are seeing that younger generation of developers are getting really passionate about uh, the 
about Rust programming language. Uh, so you can see that. Uh, so on the right is actually a image generated by um, AI, so it's not that accurate because you can see um, on, on his the guy's T-shirt is uh, some gibberish. Uh, so that that but it's just um, made makes my point. So it's uh, saying that um, Python dependency can be too heavy uh, if you are running an AI inference, you should use uh, Rust and the WebAssembly. So if you, uh, so the, on the right is um, uh, what we have did. That is to run a larger language model on my own Mac uh, with a 2MB inference app written in Rust uh, and, and was on. So, um, yeah, I will explain that later, but uh, so first, uh, you can also see that to use Wasm to uh, write an uh, application, Redis application, it can be much more smaller, like 100 times smaller, only 0.7 megabytes than the um, normal Linux container app, uh, Redis, uh, Redis app that could be easily 50 plus megabytes. And um, also on the right is the PostSQL. Um, this uh, uh, app can be, uh, the running inside the Wasm container can be only 0.8 megabytes. Um, and it starts in milliseconds instead of seconds. So compared with the Linux container, it's uh, 50, also 50 mega, megabytes. Uh, so uh, here on this page of this link, you can see the more comprehensive comparison. And um, yeah, I guess I will not get into too much details. So we would think um, that the technology path of virtualization, so the first generation of virtualization would be VMware. Uh, that is the age of hypervisor and micro VMs, and then we evolved to application containers uh, like Docker, and so what's next? So we would think that would be uh, more high-level language virtual machines like V8 or WebAssembly. Um, you can see that the sandbox mechanism uh, would provide a much safer production environment and pr protects user data and system resources. And um, uh, the bytecode uh, verification would prevent malicious code and is an isolated execution sandbox uh, uh, even among uh, WASM modules so it can be really safe and uh, very high performance. So, um, the key findings of CNCF survey 2020 has just one finding that is WebAssembly is the future and uh, we would think is the next wave of cloud computing. So um, so this year, about several, uh, three months ago, we also together with CNCF made a, a specific landscape for WebAssembly. So it has a, a, an ecosystem of uh, many projects with um, 58.4 billion uh, valuation. Uh, you can see there are languages, runtimes, application frameworks, Edge, and they are all WebAssembly. So um, yeah, it's too big, so I cannot display the full. Um, this survey is um, this, this year, 2023. So it find out that uh, many developers have been uh, choosing WebAssembly because of its faster loading time and uh, um, a lot of other advantages. And uh, on the right is um, a Web WebAssembly system interface is uh, allowing a WASM file to access system files so that you can use uh, use it on the server side. So and instead of just in the browser, so because uh, when you talk about WebAssembly, people would always 
uh, come to mind that it's only used in, in the browser, but uh, we think it just uh, will be a huge on the server in the future. So uh, already 34% of uh, people ha are using it and 34% uh, of more are considering using it in the next 12 months. Uh, so this is uh, actually the founder of Docker, uh, Solomon Hikes. He said that um, if Wasm plus Wasi existed in 2018, we wouldn't have needed to create a Docker. And uh, yeah, and that was uh, being said in 2019. And the fast forward to uh, several years later in 2022, he said uh, he saw that Wazi has been uh, launched and uh, uh, been maturing, and uh, said again that. Uh, uh, oh, that is when the news ca came out when Wasm has been officially integrated in Docker to say that um, the Wasm, basically he said that uh, Windows containers and uh, Wasm containers and OCI can package um, all, the, um, all the needed software and uh, um, he would just think it's a very, it has a really bright future. So, um, was a match uh, runtime is officially integrated in the Docker uh, desktop, and uh, when if you use Docker to run a wasm file, it will automat automatically be running inside was uh, sandbox. Uh, so I, we think there are specific use cases that's being preferred for WebAssembly. That uh, that is. Uh, IoT, Microsoft Services, SaaS plugin, browser, and what we want to talk today about is the AI inference. So uh, you can run, so with WebAssembly, you can run large language model on your own Mac or IoT devices, and you only, uh, and it's fully portable, so you don't have to uh, uh, you just only have to run code once. So uh, these are one, a very few part of the models that we support now. And uh, it's, uh, it would support uh, Lama 2 series of models. So um, it's, the advantage would be it has automatic GPU detection and the inference app, like I mentioned, is only two megabytes. It's a, a cross-platform binary. And the result uh, would be 20.54 tokens per second on a M1 MacBook. So it's fully self-hosted without, uh, without any Python dependency. So is, I said it's only four commands. We can quickly look at this command. So first is this one to install Wasm with LLM support, and uh, then download an LLM chat app. The, the app is in Wasm. So um, it is a two megabytes cross-platform binary. Uh, so that file is compiled from Rust. You can also, yeah, you can also build out your own app. Uh, and uh, then download the Llama 2 7B chatbot model. So uh, the model might be five gigabytes. You, your computer need to have, need to have those, uh, the space for that mo model file. Um, and the force is to chat with the model with uh, on CLI. It's, it's super simple. And uh, yeah, you can see that uh, some Japanese developers have found out themselves and run, get it running in very uh, short time. It's super simple. Uh, so this is what I've talked about. You can just copy, copy the code and do it. And also, even you can create uh, open AI compatible API service. 
it's, it's like the API server is completely compatible with OpenAI. And so you can, you, when you write any application, you can just replace your OpenAI API with your own self-hosted large language model. It even can be your own fine-tuned model. Uh, so these are several commands for you to create an API server. So yeah, here is a demo, I guess, yeah. So it, that's the chat warden file and GGUF uh, model file. So it's, yeah, it's loading the model inside the memory. So the, the first question usually take longer than the following up question, so it, because it needs to load the entire model in. Uh, That's, I just explained why the first, uh, yeah, the first question would usually take longer. Yeah, so because it's a long answer, because the question was uh, uh, about Chinese cuisine. So you can see the token per second is about 20 tokens per second. So when human talks, it's usually about two or three tokens per second. Yeah, I guess that's it. Uh, I will not go uh, play the entire video. So, and also there are even a simpler uh, method that is just one command. You can just run this in your, um, on your terminal and it automatically lets you choose the model that you want to test and uh, you can have it on your own computer. Yeah, it's completely offline. And uh, it's run across all different devices, including uh, different operation systems or GPUs or CPUs. And it would automatically detect the accelerator and use it. Uh, this is some community member uh, uh, article. He, he, he said uh, you, how to uh, run what match on uh, RHEL9. And that's a few steps. You can find the uh, details on this bottom link. So beyond language AI, um, so it's we say it's very good for AI inference. So it's not only about running LLM tasks; it can also uh, run the vision and audio inference as well. Um, it's a, so the Watson runtime would support PyTorch, TensorFlow, Open Vino AI framework, etc. So uh, using uh, YOMO, this uh, framework, it's real-time data stream framework. Uh, this is actually being used in, produ in production in some factory. Uh, so the factory has been using this to real-time de detecting the, uh, uh, the, on the belt, when a product comes, whether it's a, de um, de whether it's a faulty product or not. So with WASM, it can be processed uh, really fast. And the AI recognition can be uh, much faster than the uh, traditional solution. And also it supp supports a popular OpenCV and the FMPEG libraries for image processing. And you can apply vis vision and the audio AI project uh, using MediaPipe RS. So it's um, a Rust library for MediaPipe ta tasks. And it's, um, 
yeah, it's rewritten the Python part with uh, Rust, so it um, has a much better performance. Uh, so this is the uh, details uh, about that. Uh, it's very simple to use um, with the low code APIs such as uh, media pipe uh, dash pass Python and it has, it has really low overhead. So no necessary, uh, unnecessary data copy allocation, et cetera, and it's really flexible. So users can use custom media bytes as inputs So I will show you how to build a serverless AI app uh, in just several minutes with Rust and Wasm. So we are going to take advantage of this um, platform. It's a serverless platform that has connected um, large language models and uh, SaaS tools like uh, GitHub, Discord, Telegram, and Slack. So being serverless means that the developers only need to focus on business logic and no need to um, com compile or deploy Rust functions. So uh, this is how it works. So um, we are going to show how to create a learn Rust bot. So it's a programming language learning bot. Um, so uh, in at the core is uh, we we can call also call this uh, LLM bot an agent. So uh, firstly, you ask a question, and uh, the uh, and turn the question the agent would turn the question into an embedding vector, and uh, also search uh, search for the similar embeddings and return the relevant test to the uh, bot, and uh, then uh, would uh, use the relevant test at contest to ask the user's questions to, um, because we are connecting a large language model like ChatGPT or your own self-hosted one, and then uh, the bot would pass the ChatGPT response to the user. Uh, so you can try this. This, uh, this is an example bot we have, we have created. And you can use it to learn, learn the Rust language. You can try it out. But we are going to show how it's built. So first, you need to create an embedding for your data. Uh, so you have a certain data you want to feed to the bot. Um, so with this case, we have um, um, feed the app with uh, some authoritative, authoritative uh, Rust learning materials, like some uh, official documentations and other um, very good, quali high quality Rust learning, Rust related uh, knowledge. And the second is to fork the, this repo. Uh, for this repo at the platform we talk, we mentioned um, to get a webhook that can embed and store our data into a vector database. And the second step, uh, the, the third step is to upload your prepared text chunks uh, to the vector DB and name your data with one command line. So this uh, right demo is showing uh, what you need to do from step two, uh, like fork the rag embedding demo repo. So you use this platform to fork this uh, demo repo you, so that you don't have to, oh, oh yeah. So you don't have to write your, you, you don't have to write the Rust code. Uh, then you need to also connect your OpenAI API. And it now, now it's built. So you can get the webhook URL. 
and then open the terminal to enter it. So, and la later add the embeddings to the vector database. You can name your embeddings by changing this default name. And use the webhook we just got. Yeah, to rep yeah to replace the or original one. Why does? Okay, so now you have successfully uh, created an embedding. So the, uh, the second step, so that's only two steps in total. So the second step would be build the um, agent with the embedding we just created. So it's also really simple. You import the rag Discord, Discord bot demo repo uh, into flows.network for deployment, and then configure the following five uh, environment variables. So you need to, so this is a Discord bot, so that, so we need to get some uh, variables from Discord as well. Um, it looks a little bit small, but yeah. So you give it a name and go to the bot tab and turn on the three intents. Then you go to the uh, all three and click all tab and then go to the URL generator to use the link to invite the bot to your server. Uh, the bot is offline. You need to go back to the developer portal of Discord to get, get the Discord token and put it, uh, put it to the environment variables. So copy and paste the Discord token, and then the bot ID. And pay, paste the bot ID. So uh, yeah, you, you need to add the variables one by one by clicking on the add button at the right, the, the purple one. So the collection name here, you can name it yourself, uh, is the one that you just entered. So um, you, you also need to yeah, set up the other left configurations. Uh, like you can customize your own prompt and enter it in the environment uh, variable. And uh, it's uh, pretty much intuitive. You just um, then enter your OpenAI API key and uh, click on deploy. So it's uh, deploying and then a uh, building and then when it turns to deployed, uh, when it's turned to running, your bot would be online. So you would have a rag based ChatGPT bot. Uh, it's uh, super simple. You can get it down within five minutes. And you can ask this bot a question. So it's a bot that's being powered by ChatGPT, but uh, it's um, also fed with uh, uh, Rust programming language related knowledge you just fed to him by um, creating the embedding and uh, uh, yeah, and uh, building it with this uh, uh, Flowstone.network framework uh, platform. Yeah, so 
Uh, the other use case would be uh, building a code review bot. You can also connect any large language model and deploy it on your on your GitHub repo. Um, so that that's the result of deploying. So once you have this bot on your repo, you can every time when a PR or a commit is being made, you will be able to see very quick and clear what's being changed uh, and very, like in a very clear way and the summary. So it's also a few steps. Uh, you load, also load the bot template. Uh, and also you can do some customization with the template by um, tweaking the Rust function because it's, the function is written in Rust and then give the bot your OpenAI API key and then also write the bot access to GitHub. Yeah, so the very detailed um, tutorial would be, you can access as the bottom link is a C on the CNCF blog. So if you want to see what uh, the structure is, you can check out this to um, image. So on the left is actually uh, a, from a paper by Lillian Wen uh, from OpenAI. He, she said uh, an OpenAI application, oh, sorry, an LLM application that, that can also be called an agent would have, would be like a, acting like a brain. With, and so you, ha you would need to give, give the brain memory uh, and also it would do planning and then it would use, utilize the tools it can access and then it will make action. So the memory part would be the embedding we have created for the agent or the bot. And uh, on the right, you would see that the, uh, the function written in Rust would be the uh, the logic that you want to, uh, you want the bot to uh, do. It's like um, you want the bot to review your a uh, new PR or commit. So it would uh, um, use the tool and actions on the left. That would be GitHub service and GitHub integration. That's Rust create. And um, uh, would also uh, take advantage of the memory that would be uh, some vector database, and uh, it ha has the vector database integration. And so it uh, would uh, do the planning that is to utilize the chat GPT service to give uh, correct answers to anyone who has been asking the about questions. Uh, also, this one is a more uh, it's a similar structure, but uh, it's like um, because the entire uh, Rust function is compiled into Wasm and running in the Wasm runtime, so it um, has a very it has a very um, good performance and. Uh, uh, just like I mentioned in the previous, uh, the first part of my talk. So, um, yeah. Uh, I guess that would be it. And I think you can try the, uh, try it out and uh, maybe run a self-hosted uh, large language model on your own computer and uh, also write a large language model app uh, based on the framework and resources I provided. Yeah, and uh, this is the uh, open source project, uh, WASMAGE's GitHub link. You can find it uh, here. And also this is my um, Twitter and GitHub account. Uh, you can always talk to me. Um, also, join our Discord to talk with other community members and also join our monthly community meeting. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>